Hello, I'm Ryan F9 and this is a fully 3D printed motorcycle. And swing arm, frame, forks, wheel, everything you see was control peed into existence. So let's huck a booter on this Xerox machine to see if it's safe and to see why you might want to. This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Squarespace has all the tools you need to make your business idea public with a variety of templates to match your professional style. You can also create a personalized website with the AI-powered design system, Squarespace Blueprint. A few clicks is all it takes to get a fully custom website that's tailored to your brand or business and optimized for every device. All Squarespace sites are optimized for searchability thanks to their built-in SEO tools helping you show up more often in search engines. Get started with your passion project today and head to squarespace.com slash fortnine to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain using the coupon code fortnine. This is why I'm terrified. And most 3D printers are just a robot with a hot glue gun. They lay little strings that stick together and build up the part layer by layer. It's called FDM or fuse deposition modeling because we're making deposits that fuse together and build the model. But you see the problem. If any of our deposits fail to fuse properly, then the model <laughs> devolves into a tangly mess. A desktop 3D printer will purposely under extrude so that their prints don't fail like this. But that only serves to make the part weaker. Rather than a solid piece of plastic where every polymer is bonded to every other one, you end up with a bunch of spaghetti which looks solid, but actually only makes contact at a few points on the surface of each cylinder. And trigger warning for Italians, FDM is why 3D parts are infamously weak. But these are not your cosplaying grandmother's 3D printers. These are Pantheon HS Pros, each one costing more than a Ducati and each one containing a proprietarily precise strain gauge in the nozzle. And that lets Pantheon inject more and more and more filament right up to the point of over-extrusion. Like a better Icarus, these printers fly micrometrically close to the sun without melting into a mess. A Pantheon's polyamide carbon fiber actually comes within 15% of the strength you'd get from simply melting and injection molding the solid material, which by the way has more repeatable strength properties than die cast aluminum and a slightly higher maximum load than CNC 6061 T6. The printed lever is also 34 grams to Honda's 59, and it is dimensionally accurate, plus or minus 50 micrometers to Honda's plus or minus 100. So yes, additive manufacturing is safely feasible for motorcycle parts. Mmm, 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 mmm. But why would Honda want to? Well, for an OEM, the most tantalizing thing is linear scalability. Those levers take 40 minutes to print. If you want two, 80 minutes. If you want 250, one week. Whereas with casting aluminum, it'll take you eight weeks to build part number one. And once you've got your dies and your alloys figured out, you'll be churning out a thousand per week and really praying that you didn't make any mistakes on the prototype. But take these moto parts as the counterpoint. Pantheon originally designed it off of the Honda Moto Compo concept, but they're dudes, so of course they keep hucking it off things and then wanted an enduro wheel set and some enduro bodywork and seats to go with it. Naturally, you'd think about a longer front end, maybe one that's linkage actuated instead of directly mounted to the fork. And of course, every motorcyclist in the end starts to think about a supermoto. And with 3D printed parts, it's no slower or more expensive to try a thousand different things than it is to make a thousand of the same. And for an OEM, that means that Honda needn't guess how many body panels they're gonna have to stock for a 1982 Silverwing, find some place to ship and store them, and then either sell out and fail to support legacy customers, or not, and have to eat the cost on all of those unsold units. Honda can simply print the part when it's ordered in the place where it's ordered. But portability actually goes far beyond just printing parts at your local dealership. And look, the head on this printer is pulling 20 Gs every time it changes direction. You can actually see the whole jig wobbling underneath that acceleration, but the jig is internally stable 
up to 20 Gs. And that means any force it receives from the outside is gonna have little effect. You could put this machine in the back of a truck and it'll lay its deposits just fine. You could put it on an aircraft carrier in heavy seas for a 48 month deployment and you're not gonna have to stock a warehouse of spares or a machine shop and a machinist who can maybe hopefully rig something to fix your problem. You just download the file from the project engineer in Virginia who built the damn thing and print the exact part you broke. And that's why the Department of Defense is the biggest investor in 3D printing. But, I mean, who cares about war? How are these gonna help us ride more? It's like a thing now to go to Arizona for a bachelorette. Why? Because they have like these special bachelorette. The handling is perfectly rigid. It feels like any box aluminum frame would feel. Perhaps a trifle steep on the rake, but that would be one mouse drag and a tenor and filament to change. And affordability is crucial. It's a uh, crisis. <laughs> the kids around here, 90% of their salary goes towards rent and groceries. So even something like a $5,000 Honda ain't gonna happen. But 3D printing brings in a whole new breed of cost optimization. You take something like a fuel nozzle, that has lots of interior channels, and passageways. You can't cast something like that nor injection mold it. It's just far too intricate in its internal structures. So they're typically made from up to 20 smaller different parts. Only with additive manufacturing are you able to make it cheaply and simply in one solid piece, as General Electric affordably did with their fuel nozzles and their LEAP engines. If you've ever flown on a 737, then you've already soared on the wings of the 3D printed affordability. Now, aside from making bikes cheaper, 3D printing can also make parts of them much stronger. We always assume that a plastic piece like these big handlebars here are solid, but when anything injection molded beyond a certain wall thickness has to have an interior lattice with air gaps. Otherwise the internal forces are just so strong that the part will crack as it cools. Whoa! <laughs> but with the 3D printed part, you can make it actually truly solid if you want to. And the result is a strength that is far greater than we're used to thinking about plastic parts as being. This box looks possible here. Yep, and awesome. <laughs> now, I have snapped pegs off of a KLR doing jumps like this. I think I would break my ankle before I ever snapped this 3D printed foot peg. And if I were on a Grom, well, I'd probably have broke or bent 10 different pieces by now. Of course, Pantheon is clever. They know that these parts start to deform at 110 degrees Celsius. That heat deflection sets the operational ceiling of the motorcycle. And so anything near the rotors that gets really hot, well, that can't be 3D printed. Same goes for the hot lithium ion battery, the magnetic hub motor, the controller. And another limitation is that 3D printed parts are always anisotropic, right? So anything on here, it's built up layer by layer. And what that means is that each layer is a potential cracking point. So the parts can withstand in this polymer, 150 megapascal in the X, Y, but only 70 in the Z. And so all of these bits have to be made in an orientation that corresponds to how they're gonna be stressed. Whew. <laughs> So you look at something like the fasteners, those could never be 3D printed. It's a perfect example of something that has to be tensile and also shear resistant. Now, a lot of people don't respect the inabilities of 3D printing enough. Even more people don't respect the capabilities of 3D printing enough. But when you get both right in equal measure, Dude, that was so big. Oh, you get a rad little bike for 500 bucks in filament and a week's worth of print jobs. Thanks very much for watching. Oh, 
Oh shit! It's okay, let's keep going for now. <laughs> what did you do? It's a piece of the hub motor. Oh no. The one thing that isn't free printed broke. But yeah, don't worry about that. No <laughs> nothing happened. How could this happen to me? Okay. Oh no, f Oh no! It's all going, it's gonna pop right off soon. Hold on. I'll legit with the. <laughs> All right, well, that might have to be a pause on things. <laughs>